Hello and merry meet, welcome back to Witch Fix. I'm Sarah and today I'm looking at Circle of Three book two which is called Merry Meet. Now you might remember in a previous episode I looked at Circle of Three book one, so mote it be, and in that I discussed how the writer Isabel Bird is not someone who actually exists, it's a pen name for a male author. And I was struck again while reading this book, which I don't think I mentioned in the previous review, at how well he's captured what it is like to be a sort of teenage girl in school. Now obviously I'm not American, I don't know a lot about the high school experience, but the things that go on in the book do kind of tie into some of the things that I experienced when I was in middle and upper school. So I think he's done a really good job of actually writing a book that, although it is written by a man, does read like it is believably written by a woman. And I just wanted to mention that because I thought I might forget again. And I do plan to review the rest of the, I think, 15 books in this series because I've never read all of them before. So eventually we will be out of books that I have previously read. I think I've only read the first three or four. This one I didn't have as many recollections of as the first book. I probably read So Mote It Be about ten times it's sort of during my adolescence and later on as research when I was at uni. But Merry Meet I think I only read once to do part of my research project. So it was kind of familiar to me but also surprised me in terms of the plot. The focus of the first book was very much on Kate, Annie and Cooper finding each other and finding a way into the practice of witchcraft and Wicca. It was very much a beginning. This book is a continuation of that and it starts with Kate and Cooper and Annie going to their first open ritual, which is a spring equinox ritual. I thought that was quite interesting because it kind of shows their involvement in the wider pagan community. They're not just practicing as teenagers by themselves. They're being guided and being introduced to sort of elders in the community, if you like. It's at this ritual that they are given the offer of attending a sort of witchcraft class, which is free and run out of their local occult bookshop. And it's basically like an introduction to Wicca and witchcraft, at the end of which they'll be given the chance to go through a dedication ritual to begin their year in a day of study and commit to becoming witches. Again, I thought that was really interesting. The kind of way that that features into the novel is very much that Kate has to make a choice as to whether she wants to go back to the sort of safe, normal life that she had at the beginning of the first book, or if she wants to continue down the path she began on in the first book. So that was quite interesting. There's also more conflict arising between her and her sort of group of normal, invert quote marks, friends, and Annie and Cooper, who are obviously her witch friends. And she begins to feel the strain of being in the broom closet because she can't talk to her boyfriend or her oldest friends about her being interested in Wicca. And later on, she feels like she can't talk to her parents about something that's upsetting her because she feels like she can't tell them about Wicca. And I think we've all been there. We've sort of had disagreements within the pagan community. Maybe we've been upset or something we've heard or read online and we just can't. We felt we couldn't talk to our parents about it. In this case, it is rather more serious because the thing she can't talk to them about is that someone in the pagan community that she's part of is in trouble and she's worried about them. And it's very upsetting to her, but she feels she can't discuss that. So the main plot line, aside from the wicker classes and Kate's struggles, is that a new character has been introduced called Sasha. Sasha turns up at the open ritual and she kind of insinuates herself into Kate, Annie and Cooper's group, as well as joining their high school and getting in with Kate's crowd of older friends. Sasha is hiding a number of things, which I won't discuss because that's a surprise. But what I will say is Sasha is quite interesting to me as a character to introduce at this point because her attitude towards magic is that it's a way to get what you want as quickly as possible and that it is also a sort of blunt weapon that you can use to attack people who've wronged you. So at one point they're asked uh, how they would deal with this problem of someone talking shit about them and being horrible. And it's a sort of exercise in their groups to talk about how they would solve this pro problem magically. And some people say, well, Clearly the person who's talking about me is very unhappy in themselves, so I would try and make them feel better about themselves so that they wouldn't have to take it out on me. Other people have said I would try and build bridges with this person and find out if I've done something to upset them. 
Sasha's response is that she would curse the hell out of them and get them to leave her alone. And I know we've all been in situations like that. I definitely have. Where it's, sometimes it's hard to be the bigger person and to walk the higher ground. And I think this book just made me more aware of that and made me think about how different problems can be handled in different ways, even magically speaking. Something else that occurred to me while I was reading this book, and it's probably just me, but I'd be interested in hearing if it is just me. Uh, Annie and Cooper, who are Kate's witch friends from the first book, Annie being kind of bookish and a science nerd and Cooper being kind of a rocker chick who comes from a very wealthy family. They always seem to be hanging out together when Kate runs into them. They always seem to have discussed things together when Kate wants to ask them for advice. And it just seems like there is Kate, who is the main character of the book, and she goes off and does other things. But Annie and Cooper seem to be more of a twosome when she's not there. And it just kind of occurred to me that neither of them in the book come across as particularly interested in Kate's love life with Scott her boyfriend from book one and I just wondered if perhaps they were maybe into each other or secretly dating and that would be nice if that's what was happening because I think it would be nice to have a sort of young adult book with that kind of romance in it and not just Kate and her football player boyfriend for the sort of straight market. Speaking of Kate and her football player boyfriend there is trouble in paradise and Kate starts to wonder if maybe the spell that she used to get Scott to notice her didn't just tie him to her for a short amount of time and now he's going to go off and do something else that maybe it's wearing off. And she also meets a new guy who is called Tyler and he is at the open ritual for the spring equinox. He's related to one of the owners of the magical bookshop and he was actually raised Wiccan and I think it's really interesting because he does talk about that a bit and I think that's an interesting character in to introduce that you know there are people who have been raised in Wiccan households and that they might have a unique perspective on how Wicca works in your life and what it's like for forming relationships with people who aren't interested in Wicca or who aren't who or who are actively against it he also mentions that his dad fought his mum for custody of them and sort of took her to court and tried to make out that she was like an evil satan worshiper and i thought again that was an interesting thing to bring in in terms of educating people about issues that the wiccan community faces i know this isn't such a big deal anymore but going back a couple of years it was quite a big thing that you used to hear about quite a lot in pagan circles like online especially in america you know people would be sort of worried that their children would be taken away it would cause divorce proceedings to be complicated people were fighting for their right to have their religious emblem like the pentacle displayed on military graves and people were fighting you know tooth and nail to stop that from happening and it it does come across as just a teeny bit dated because i don't hear so much of this sort of thing now although i'm sure it still goes on but i thought it was nice that it kind of educates people about wicca on a level that isn't just this is what spells and magic is but this is the community and community is actually the watchword of this second book because it is about how the pagan community kind of take care of its own and how they sort out problems which again i found really interesting and it takes it to a sort of a different level and introduces new topics and new interesting plot lines in the future I'm also really looking forward to reading the other books in the series because I want to see how Kate deals with being outed as Wiccan to her group of friends uh, who are non-pagans, how her family deals with it because they go to church every week and I get the feeling her family might be, you know, quite religious. And Kate is kind of a cookie cutter main character, so she's very easy to project oneself onto, but also because she's so clear-cut normal American teenage girl trademark then it is quite easy for I suppose her plot line to encompass quite a lot of these issues that people might face if they came to Wicca and hadn't previously been interested in anything alternative because sometimes people come to Wicca because they've been interested in magic in the occult in horror films in various books and things about it basically things we talk about on this podcast and it's not entirely a surprise to people and I think it kind of eases them into the whole topic whereas if you just find out about it randomly and decide to get into it it can be a bit of a shock to people. The next book in the series is called Second Sight and I think it focuses mostly on Cooper as a character so that's going to be quite interesting. 
I got my copy of Merry Meet and Second Sight on eBay, but I may have to look into getting the Kindle ebooks of these because if there are 15 of them, they're going to be taking up quite a lot of room and I don't have the shelf space. I've already got quite a large pile of books building up to review and they are occupying a bookcase, the shelves over this desk and now my windowsill. So we're, we're running out of space here at Witchfix Podcast HQ. But uh, I am looking forward to getting my hands on some more books and also reading the rest of this series because it's so interesting so far. I'm now going to read you an extract from page 57 and 58. And this takes place at the first witchcraft class that the girls attend and they're with Sasha. And I thought it was quite interesting because it discusses a bit about the religious aspects of Wicca, but also it sort of is a nice way to sort of showcase how Sasha's intentions and use of witchcraft are slightly different to those of the pre-existing group of girls who we met in Circle of Three, book one. Witchcraft is a religion, Rowan said, but it isn't a religion centred around one particular book, like the Torah or the Quran, or around one particular figure, like Jesus or the Buddha. That's what confuses a lot of people. Witchcraft is a pagan religion, meaning that it doesn't focus on only one god or goddess. It's a religion based on rituals and festivals practiced by people who lived in close communion with nature. But it's also a changing religion. People bring into it various rituals and beliefs of their respective cultures. Unlike Christianity and Judaism, which have established sets of rules and basic beliefs, witchcraft has very few set beliefs. Different witches practice it differently. Some do magic, others don't. Some worship particular gods and goddesses, others don't worship any at all. Then what holds it all together, asked Stanny. A basic belief that everything in the world is connected somehow to everything else, and that becoming more attuned to these connections and to the cycle of nature can bring great changes to your life, Rowan answered. I know that sounds like a non-answer, but it's true. Witches believe that because everything is connected, what we do with our lives creates changes all around us. We believe that by becoming more aware of the natural processes of life and nature, we can learn to work with these processes to effect change. We might use magic to make these changes. We might use chanting and singing and drumming. We might use meditation. But whatever we do, what we're trying to accomplish is the same. We're trying to make positive changes in our lives and in the world we live in. That makes witchcraft sound really boring, Sasha said. What about all the robes and candles and incense and all of that? Where's the fun stuff? You can't just look at the trappings and costumes of ritual, Rowan said. Those things are fun, but the real power of witchcraft is in the changes that take place when you dedicate yourself to understanding the rhythms and cycles of nature and to explore your connections with the world and how those things can have an effect on your own life and on the lives of others. I still like the robes and the incense, Sasha whispered to Kate. This other stuff sounds too eggheady for me. I don't necessarily agree with everything that's said in that section because I don't really think that witchcraft is in itself a religion. I think it is the practice of witchcraft that makes you a witch. Wicca is the religion and I think this book suffers from something that I noted in the Silver Ravenwolf book Solitary Witch that it kind of equates being a witch to being a practitioner of Wicca and I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, I see myself as a witch. I do follow some of the tenets of Wicca and some of the beliefs but it's something that I've kind of grown out of not in the sense that it's a childish thing, but in the sense of that's where my first sort of seeds of spirituality were sown. And I've kind of grown out of that and into other things as I sort of grow and reach out. And I'm making kind of branchy motions with my arms. And I don't know why, because this is an audio only podcast, but you get what I mean. But I think it is nice to include it in the book. And it obviously is kind of simplistic because it's for a, a younger audience. And I think that as a starting point for explaining witchcraft and magic generally, which is what they're trying to do in this class and in the book, I suppose, is an OK starting point. It doesn't really say anything that I would disagree with incredibly strongly. Having said that, I do kind of disagree that you can be a witch without practising witchcraft or magic, because I know there's a lot of contention about what makes someone a real witch and what doesn't. But if you're not practising witchcraft, then I don't see how you can be a witch. But That's just my view and I'm sure there'll be people who have a different take on things. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and I'll see you all next time. If in the meantime you come across a book or something that's hiding on your shelves and you think I might like to give it a look, 
get in touch on Twitter at witchfix or via Gmail, which is witchfixpodcast at gmail.com. And I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.